So Democrats thought they nailed Lauren Boebert on the Constitution, but turns out they were so far off that it's literally embarrassing to think how these people got elected. This is The Brink. And folks, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you like me and you like what we do here. And if you love it, you can also become a Daily Caller Patriot. Now, I know I've been saying this, uh, but I read all the comments. Uh, and for all the haters out there, I think that you would actually love to be a Daily Caller Patriot because, look, it's you get so much bang for your buck. I'm, I'm not even kidding you. Um, and I'm on the Daily Caller Patriot site. You can read some articles I've written, so you can hate on me there, too. It'll be amazing. All right, folks, so this is one of my favorite topics because Democrats and even some Republicans, including the Supreme Court, They get it wrong every single time. There is no such thing as a constitutionally mandated separation of church and state. Now, Democratic Rep Maxwell Frost, he accused Boebert of attacking the Constitution's alleged separation of church and state. Have a listen. My colleague, Representative Lowen Boebert, said, quote, the church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk, end quote, junk being the Constitution and Bill of Rights. The Bible itself in 2 Corinthians actually warns us against this. Paul warned against this. He warned us against people who would preach of a Christ that differs from the true Christ that we learn about in the Bible. And I think it's incumbent, especially upon us uh, as Christians, and me as a Christian, to be at the forefront of the fight to ensure that white nationalism and Christian nationalism doesn't see the light of day. Now, I am personally, and again, this is not from the Daily Caller. This is me, Brianna Lyman. I am personally offering Frost $500 to find me a spot in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights where it says that there has to be a separation of church and state. Oh, wait, he can't. You know why? Because the separation of church and state, it actually comes from an 1802 letter from Thomas Jefferson known as the Danbury Baptist Letter. Now, the purpose of this letter was to assure religious leaders that the government would not encroach upon their religious liberties. I'm going to read a part of it for you right now that will uh, basically tell you where the separation of church and state came from. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declare that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. You cannot in good faith argue that Jefferson or any of the founders wanted a godless society or a, a government that you know turns a blind eye to religion, right? They never advocated for theocracy, but conversely, they never omitted faith from their work. But then you have Democrats and again, some Republicans who rely very heavily on a few Supreme Court cases, which again, is not the Constitution, it's not the Bill of Rights, that simply cite Jefferson's phraseology as irrefutable proof that the founders intended for there to be, you know, some level of separation. And while there can be a separation of the state and the church as an institution, that doesn't necessarily mean that there should be a separation between the state and any influence of God. And to try and spin it like we weren't founded on Judeo-Christian values is dishonest, right? George Washington literally invoked God during his inaugural speech when he literally said that it would be wrong not to praise God. It would be peculiarly improper to admit in this first official act my fervent supplications to that almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect, that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and happiness to the people of the United States, Washington said. Now, he later invoked religion itself in his farewell address again. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indis dispensable supports. Now, Jefferson followed suit, saying in his second inaugural address, quote, I shall need to the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our forefathers as Israel of old from their native land and planted them in a country flowing with all the necessaries and comforts of life. And look, God has been integrated into our everyday lives for decades, okay? The treasury they began printing in God We Trust on coins back in 1865 after the public, right? The people made petitions. The Supreme Court literally Really opens with a traditional cry that includes the phrase, God save the United States in this honorable court. All Senate sessions open with prayer. Truman designated a national day of prayer in 1952. Our national anthem praises God. I mean, for goodness sake, the very last line of the Declaration of Independence literally says that the nation has a, quote, firm reliance on God. So now you might be saying, 
okay, I was lied to my whole life. There's no separation, you know, constitutionally mandated. But then why do they tell us that there's a separation? Let's head over to the Supreme Court. So back in 1962, the court decides this very important case of Angle vs. Vitale, which says that the state cannot hold prayer in public school, even if the participation was voluntary and the prayer was not affiliated with a particular religion. Now, the court ruled that holding official prayer violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Here is where they relied on Jefferson's letter as justification to decide that the public school breached the separation since school is a publicly funded government entity. But just as Potter Stewart dissented, I believe correctly, that the quote, court has misapplied a great constitutional principle. I cannot see how an official religion is established by letting those who want to say a prayer say it. On the contrary, I think that to deny the wish of these school children to join in reciting this prayer is to deny them the opportunity of sharing in the spiritual heritage of our nation. Stewart was right. But that's not the only case. So in the opinion of the high court in Zorak v. Clausen, the justices wrote, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. If we are no longer one nation under God, we will be a nation God under. And I know so many of you feel like we are either at that point or uh, we're headed to that point. And I feel the same way because to try and convince uh, Americans, especially the next generation of Americans, that, that the United States was not founded on Judeo-Christian values is, is a disservice to the history and the heritage of the United States. Uh, it's a disservice to what made America prosper. You know, when you start removing God, any sense, whether whether you are, you know, Jewish, Catholic, Christian, you know, Islamic, when you start removing faith from children's lives and they're not getting it from outside, or they're not getting it from their family, but they're not getting any kind of sense of community, you set the nation up for failure, right? You, you to try and, and spin this as if, you know, the United States was created as this atheist type of nation or uh, that the government was supposed to be this atheist type of government, it sends the wrong message, okay? We are not a godless society. We shouldn't be a godless society. And like I said before, if we are a nation without God, we are a nation gone under. Folks, we will have more for you tomorrow on The Brink.